It's been more than half a year since the new Congress convened in Washington, D.C., but to this point, lawmakers have been unable to compromise on any big pieces of legislation. While that may be a win for some Democrats, what does it mean for the country? Senator Jean Shaheen is our guest this morning with the answers. We appreciate you being here, Senator. Nice to be here. So uh, you are headed back to work within a couple of weeks here. The climate is going to be different because lately President Trump has been on the attack against the majority leader in the Senate, right. Mitch McConnell. What's this going to mean moving forward, do you think? Well, I don't know. But, you know, it's interesting because the committees that I'm on, the Armed Services Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, the Small Business Committee, Appropriations, we have very strong bipartisan agreement on most of the work that we've done. We were able to put out a Russia sanctions bill that included Iran sanctions and North Korean sanctions that passed the Senate 97 to 2 and overwhelmingly passed the House. Um, we passed a defense authorization bill out of the Armed Services Committee on a unanimous vote, the first time since I've been in the Senate that we got a unanimous vote on the um, NDAA bill. Uh, in small business, we passed out of committee on a, almost a unanimous vote, six um, bills that deal with small business. So I, I know that um, there's a lot of talk about division in Congress, but in the Senate, there also a, there's also a lot of agreement. Let's rewind a little bit to one of the more consequential moments on the Senate floor that we've seen in decades that uh, either famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, right. thumbs down from Senator McCain. You were actually front and center watching this unfold. Did you have a sense of what he was going to do ahead of time? I, I don't think anybody really had an a full understanding of what he was going to do. There were rumors that he was concerned about the bill. He'd been saying that for weeks in advance of the vote. And so for me, as a supporter of the Affordable Care Act, who believes that we need to fix it, um, not repeal it and start all over again, I was really pleased to see John McCain do that. You know, um, especially given this point in his life where he's been diagnosed with brain cancer. He has shown so much courage and his um, presence in the Senate, and of course he's one of uh, America's true heroes, is, it, for me, it was really invigorating to watch him take that stand and say, we can do this better. You mentioned the heroism there. There's an odd symmetry to this in that, you know, if we rewind two years, that was one of the first sort of insults that rocked the, the political world when President right. Can candidate Trump then said essentially, uh, you know, I, I like people who weren't captured. And people were shocked by this, and then, you know, the, the people thought, oh, that's the end of Trump, and it, it didn't turn, turn out that way. Who knows if that informed Senator McCain's decision, but is there a lesson there in that, you know, on the campaign trail, the insults worked, but in Washington, it's a lot harder in the trenches if you've made enemies of your allies to actually get things done. Well, that's right. And, you know, when you're in a leadership position, I learned this as governor, you don't have the luxury of getting mad at people and saying, I'm not going to work with them. The goal is to get things done and to do what's in the best interest of the country. And that means working with whoever we need to in order to get something done. We still have an underlying public policy problem here uh, in health care. Is it time to start looking more towards the direction of a hybrid single payer or something along those lines? Well, I think it's time to put everything on the table and to really examine what we need to do. In the short term, we need to address the instability in the individual marketplace. We've seen counties across the country who don't have any insurer because they've pulled out of the marketplace because of the uncertainty, and that uncertainty has been created around what was going to happen with repeal of the Affordable Care Act, around whether the president and the administration were going to continue to pay the payments to insurance companies that allow people who can't afford health insurance to buy into health insurance. Um, all of that has created uncertainty. We need to address that. We can do that now. I have legislation others do to help fix that. Um, I'm encouraged that Lamar Alexander has said he's going to hold hearings as soon as we get back. He's already scheduled two hearings. He and Patty Murray have agreement on how to move forward. So I'm hopeful that in the short term, we're going to address the instability, and then in the long term, we're going to look at what we need to do to fix um, health care so that it's more affordable for people and so that everybody can get access who needs it. And part of that, I think, needs to be looking at at least a public option. It's one of the things I voted for back when we did the act. Um, we also talked about expanding Medicaid. Medicare, so it would cover people down to age 55. Um, both of those failed, but I think those are the kinds of answers that we need to look at again. 
Let's look at the events in Charlottesville. Probably one of the more notorious figures to emerge from that is a, a man from Keene by the name of Christopher Cantwell, who's now under arrest in Virginia. Uh, shocking to see that someone from New Hampshire was down there in such a leadership role. But should the state and federal government be doing more to try and track or, or examine? Uh, I know this is difficult because of the nature of free speech in this country, but to try and see what we have going on in our country in terms of these violent extremists? Um, well, I think there's a lot of tracking of those extremists. I think um, what we need are leaders who work to bring the country together. I think the president's rhetoric following, following Charlottesville has been very uh, erratic. And, and what we don't want is the leader of this country exacerbating those divisions. We want him to show moral authority to point out that in America, and he said this, he has said this, that there is no room for hate groups, for neo-Nazis, for white supremacists, but he's equivocated on that, and that's been the problem. That provides an opening for those groups to think that what they're doing is legitimate, and we can't allow that to continue. Free speech is important, but you can't cry fire in a crowded theater. And so we can't allow that kind of um, extremism to encourage violence. And Cantwell described New Hampshire as a kind of white haven. That's, that's chilling in a way, that, that he sees this state that way. Um, it is. And I think if you talk to people in New Hampshire, we have people who are tolerant, who um, work with their neighbors, who try and help out wherever they can. We have one of the highest instances of volunteerism in the country. And so to hear someone talk about New Hampshire as being this haven for groups that, that might um, encourage hate is really disappointing. Let's shift gears to foreign policy here. The president unveiled a new approach on Afghanistan, which actually uh, a lot of people have said doesn't really change the course that much of what's going on there. And you were fairly supportive. Why do you think uh, more troops a a without a timeline is going to make a difference there after 16 years of American presence in Afghanistan? Well, first of all, I think it's important to point out that we do have a national security interest in what happens in Afghanistan. As people remember, the attacks on 9-11 were planned in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda had a stronghold there. They could operate freely. We do not want terrorist groups to get that kind of um, ability to operate out of Afghanistan without any anyone controlling what they're doing. So I think we continue to have an interest there. We have made real strides in terms of um, opening up that country for women, for young people who now can go to school, and I don't want to see that progress roll back. So I do support the president in terms of staying the course, which is pretty much what he talked about. Um, he's left up to the generals how many troops we're going to send in there. Most people suggest it'll be about 4,000 more people to do training, but obviously they're going to do some other support missions, it appears, as right. well. Nothing's been uh, reported on that. Um, and you were saying that the president had said we're done with nation building there. Is there any concern that the programs that we have instituted for women and girls and making sure that there is a, at least a measure of some equality uh, being introduced into that society, do you worry that the U.S. might back away from those commitments? Um, I do, and I was pleased to hear the president talk about diplomacy and about economic um, assistance because that has been very important and continues to be as we look at developing countries and how we can um, help to change them. I have been disappointed in seeing the president's budget that called for cutting the State Department over 30 percent. I don't think if we're going to beef up diplomatic efforts, the way to do that is to cut back on the resources they have. And so I think we need to continue to understand that diplomacy, that economic support are very important tools that we have as we work around the world. And, you know, General Mattis has said on a number of occasions that if he doesn't have um, the diplomatic efforts that he needs more bullets because it's going to require more military engagement. So we need to make sure that we have robust diplomatic activities and that we have economic support. These ships colliding in the Pacific uh, with other ships, is there something nefarious going on here? It seems odd that the U.S. Navy would just be ramming into things uh, at random. 
Well, I think there's real concern about what is going on, and um, the Admiral of the Seventh Fleet has been removed after these four incidents in the last eight months, um, two of which, as you point out, have killed Navy sailors, and um, so we need to get to the bottom of what has happened. We've already seen a report on the Fitzgerald accident. It didn't really um, go into great detail, as I read it, as to what caused that accident. So we really need to see what happened. I support the the pause in operations for um, a day as in each of the arenas as we try and get to the bottom of what happened. But, you know, like everybody in this country, when we lose our men and women who are serving and for those 17 sailors who have lost their lives and for those who are injured, um, it's a real tragedy. And I certainly share in the condolences of all Americans to the families for those losses. Seeing these kinds of things happen, should we be worried about, you know, North Korea, the situation is so tense and unfortunately it's looking like we can't even navigate the waters of the Pacific right here. Is there a concern that should things escalate that we're ready and effective to be able to do the job there? Well, that's why a very close examination of what has happened is very important because, yes, it sends the absolute wrong message to the North Koreans, to China, to Russia, to those countries who would undermine the United States.